Professor Peck asked me to talk about uh, these territorial and maritime disputes in East Asia. And it's actually a really interesting topic, and I'll tell you my answer right now, which is I don't have any solution to it. But uh, I want to start out by asking, does history cast a shadow on the present? And in some ways, I think we often uh, start out looking at East Asia with perhaps a little bit too much of a, of a different lens. Because here in the United States, I would say that, yeah, it does. I actually had a chance to talk to the chancellor of Ole Miss, who actually finally, about four years ago or so, decided that they were going to stop using the rebel flag as, an exa as, as the symbol of the official University of Mississippi. Now, what's really interesting to me about this is, growing up in California, right, this to me is sedition, right? I mean, you don't have another flag. There's only one flag. It's America, right? We've got one, one flag. Clearly, this is ridiculous. But to many people in the United States, this matters tremendously to them. I'm not here to defend it or, 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 or whatever. But the point is, even in the United States, we have history. Does anybody remember? Who knows when the Civil War was? 1861, right? Almost 150 years ago. But there are still elements today that have a huge impact on politics, on, on schools, and everything else, right? And I think it's important that we, that we remember that as we start to talk about what these maritime disputes are in East Asia. Because it's not just Asians who can't get over their history. History affects all of us in many ways. So, I'm going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to try and make a distinction, actually, between historical disputes uh, and then territorial disputes, although they're often interlinked in East Asia. Then I'm going to try and ask, like, why does anybody care? And I'll give you a good answer, or a bad answer, which is I'm actually not sure why anybody cares. But they do. And I've given up trying to say they shouldn't care, because clearly they do. And finally, I will conclude with, uh, in some ways, what I think might be the interesting relationship or interaction between business and politics, uh, both in the region and then for uh, these things, right? So, in a way, what are, what are territorial and historical disputes? It's good to sort of start out by making a couple distinctions. And the first distinction I want to make is between borders and frontiers. A border is a line. It's a clear line between two political units. And a frontier is a space. It's some big, vague area where you've got political control on one side that sort of wavers out. Then there's nobody. It's not clear anybody owns the, owns the land. And then over here, you eventually get some, some other political uh, uh, control. So a border is a line, and a frontier is a space. And my one sentence history of the world is, it's been a process of turning frontiers into borders. That's what we've been doing. Now, this is a frontier. This is taken from uh, so somewhere in the uh, nomadic regions of northern China, where you've got people who live semi-nomadic. They follow, they follow the seasons. They move around. Much of what China did for the last three or four hundred years is try and turn those frontiers into borders. Now here in the United States, I actually uh, am from a place, uh, I actually, I'm from California, but then I taught for a long time in New Hampshire. If you go to New Hampshire or Vermont and you go up to the, to the U.S.-Canada border, you can leave the paved road, you get on a dirt road, you leave the dirt road, you walk, and you hack your way through the jungle, and you get to these little white posts in the middle of this massive wilderness. The, this is a border. The USA stops here, Canada starts there. And we do it all the way down. I mean, that is a clear line down to the inch where Canada stops and where the USA starts. Now, we've worked out our border with Canada. And one of the uh, important things to note is that borders tend to be very stable. Because one of the problems with a frontier is who, who owns what? Who's going to be uh, responsible legally for what? What currency do we use? Whose people are they? If you're going to make a border, you've got two political units that are willing to negotiate with each other and agree that I stop here and that you start there. So there's an awful lot that goes into making borders out of the world. Countries have to already decide they're willing to live with someone. If not, they don't adjudicate a border. 
Now, the interesting thing about East Asia is that land borders are actually pretty well fixed. And some of these borders have been around for literally about a thousand years or so. So here is uh, Lang Son, Vietnam. They demarcated, the Song Dynasty demarcated this with an old Vietnamese uh, uh, dynasty in about 1088 or so. And that city, Lang Son on the border, and the Great Gate there has been the border between China and Vietnam to this day. And in fact, when they formally demarcated their border in modern technology with the, you know, the geographers and everything else, that's where the border was at this, at this gate here. That's an incredibly stable border. Another very stable border is the Korea-China border. The Yalu River has been the border between what was Korea and what was China, again, for almost a thousand years, for over a thousand years. So these are incredibly stable. Now there's a difference, again, there's, there's a difference between borders and frontiers. There's a difference between land borders and ocean borders, or water maritime borders. What's the biggest difference between a land border and a, and a, and a water border? People don't live in water. People live on land. So in many ways, demarcating a land border is actually really important for countries. Because you have to figure out, are you Chinese, are you Vietnamese, are you Korean, are you not, are you US or Canadian? Every single one of you probably has a passport. Uh, it tells you which country you belong to. We have to figure it out. It's not easy to have a bunch of people where you're not sure whose country they belong. There's a fight, there's a business dispute. Which government do they use? How do you adjudicate it? What if you decide, all these people decide they're not yours and there's somebody else and people go back and forth, right? Borders are actually really important for stabilizing all those kind of things with people on land. The thing about water is people don't live there. So in some ways they're very different because you're allowed in many ways to fight over them because you don't have to worry about the same kinds of things you would if you had a, a fight on land. Now in East Asia, Almost all of the borders have been demarcated by formal modern means, where they've got the formal treaty and everybody says, I stop here, you start here. China, for example, has demarcated about 22,000 kilometers of its borders. The only one they don't, haven't quite resolved is India. 13 other countries, 22,000 kilometers, they've got a treaty that says, we stop here, you start there. It's actually very stable. What they haven't done is demarcated the maritime borders. So here, for example, are the Spratly Islands. You can't see the islands because they actually barely stick above the water. So if you want to live there, you have to do things like this. Right? There's a bunch of countries that, that dispute these islands. Here is Dokdo or Takeshima. Some uninhabited, uninhabitable rocks in the middle of the ocean between Japan and Korea that both are claiming. And the Koreans actually uh, own it right now, so they built a little lighthouse and stuff like that. But the only way that somebody can live there is if they get food airdropped to them. Right? So what are these borders then, right? This is the South China Cheese, the, the Spratly Islands. There's a bunch of countries, about 12 countries in total that have some of these claims. Uh, the biggest ones though, Philippines, Taiwan, etc. So the Philippines is this yellow line and they claim everything basically down to the coast of Malaysia. Vietnam is here. They claim everything out to here. China has, I think, the most aggressive claim. But the point is everybody has different claims about, about these and we'll talk about them later. It's not a Chinese problem. Japan has territorial disputes over uninhabited rocks with every single country that it could have territorial disputes with. So these northern territories here are still disputed by Russia and Japan as a result of the 1904 war between the two. This is uh, Dokdo and Takeshima. These are the Senkakus or the Daoyu. Now why is this, right? In some ways, this is a result of modernity. And we'll talk about this later. It's a result of countries, nation states, setting out to define what is a border, what is a maritime border, 
making up a bunch of rules about we have a three mile exclusive economic zone, a 200 mile, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about this because there's also a difference between historical and territorial disputes. Often these disputes are, are, are pitched or framed as historical disputes between the countries. But they're actually not historical. They're really modern. I'm going to repeat this, but I want to make it clear, it's not a historical dispute. If you go back in time 500 years ago and asked a Korean king what he thought about these rocks, he wouldn't think about them. The only people who cared about these rocks 500 years ago were fishermen who wanted to avoid them. <laughs> it didn't matter, because there's not where people live. The places that people live, they had to figure out. And there's a bunch of other places right here at Tsushima where people lived. They had to figure out, are they Japanese or Korean? And they did. So it's not historical in that sense. These are modern territorial disputes as countries are trying to figure out what it means to be a nation state in the 20th or 21st century. Now to put this in contrast, for all the talk, and you may have heard, because if you, if you pay it all attention to uh, you know, East Asian politics or East Asian IR or Shinzo Abe or whatever, Xi Jinping, all you've been hearing about in the last year is how dangerous these things are. I will also tell you I'm very skeptical at this point because the best contrast with that is this disputed maritime border between South and North Korea. So there's also been, uh, here's, here's the DMZ between North and South Korea. Here's the land border, which they've demarcated down to the inch. Here's what North Korea wants the, board, the maritime border to be, sort of perpendicular to the land border. They want it to go out like this. The green line is what South Korea claims the border is. Now, I'm not defending North Korea, but I will point out the North Koreans hate this. They think all of this should be North Korean and they should be able to fish there and blah, blah, blah. And what the South Koreans do is they hold live fire exercises within view of the naked, within naked eye of the North Korean border. You can see them 20 miles away. And the North Koreans hate this. And so every now and then, the North Koreans do something like this and they shoot back. That's a disputed border. That's a disputed maritime border. The two sides cannot agree and regularly they shoot each other. So Chunan and Yunpyeong were in 2010. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in 2009, South Korea shot up a North Korean ship in those disputed waters. And North Korea's on record as saying, we'll get you back. And four months later, they sunk the Chunan. There were shootings in those maritime, uh, in that disputed area, about every 10 years or so, every five years. There was a shelling on Yunpyeong in 2002. There was 1999. There's another incident up here. Nine, you go back to 1953, and about every couple years, there's a shooting incident. Because those two sides really disagree. And they are really poking each other in the nose, trying to get each other pissed off. The last shooting incident in the Spratleys was in 1988. So it's been actually 25 years since there's been any exchange of fire between China. The last exchange of fire with Japan was 1945. Uh, you're going back decades when these countries haven't exchanged fire at all. The, the disputes right now are actually uh, Coast Guard, fishing vessels, etc. So in some ways, I think it's easy, it's, it's, it's very easy to have a lot of hype about these. Because China and Japan are talking tough, there's a lot of rhetoric and chest thumping and finger pointing. But as yet, neither side has chosen to actually militarize uh, those maritime disputes. In large part, I think, because both sides realize that militarizing them to the degree that North and South Korea have, where they're basically shooting each other every couple of years, is an extremely destabilizing, dangerous step to take. And the contrast needs to be with North and South Korea, because that's where people are really shooting each other all the time. But there's another point beyond this. So I gave a talk at, up at um, Pepperdine in October, and I was talking about, it was all about North Korea. Uh, and somebody raises their hand after my talk, and they're like, 
North Korea you know, engaged in two acts of war in the last year. These two shellings, etc. Blah, blah, blah. You got a crazy man, it's, you know, leader. Nuclear test. And, and so when I was done, I said, you know, you can call it an act of war because people died. But even with all of that going on, neither North or South Korea has chosen to mobilize their entire armies, 100,000 guys over the border, plane strikes on Seoul, artillery shelling of Pyongyang, etc. It's border skirmishing. And so as we try and put these disputes in context, it's very important to remember, there's a bunch in which you've got fishermen and coast guards. You've got one in which you have navies shooting at each other every now and then. But even that, is not all-out war the way it was in 1953. So there are really levels. When we put it in, in that type of a context, the types of disputes that we're looking at now, they could get worse, but they haven't gotten worse yet. And I think there's some good reasons for it. Part of it is all sides realize that that's a, that's a path uh, that's unequivocally bad for their own domestic interests, whether it's Chinese or Japanese. It's unequivocally bad for the region. So there's a lot of domestic politics and domestic hay being made by these guys as they look tough, and we'll get to that in a minute. But so far, we haven't even really gotten the militaries involved, anything like even this, the North and South Korean one. Now, what are they called? They're called historical disputes, and this is one of the, one of the things that I just roll my eyes every time I see this. So what you get is, you get, this is a Korean newspaper, Joseon Ilbo, and this is some guy pointing to some map from 1400 or whatever, and he says, oh, see, look, we've got a little thing that says it's Dokdo. One time I was in Japan, and I did a, a, a TV interview for NHK. So they said to me, here's a Japanese map from whatever, 1536. Here's a Korean map from, four, you know, which, Korean, which map is right? And I said, you're both wrong. It's not historical, because they didn't care about them the same way. It's a modern dispute. It's a dispute brought about by the fact that now we can demarcate water in a way that would have been f laughable to someone 500 years ago. What do you mean you're going to water out there? What I care about is where the people live. We're gonna f I can't even see over the ocean and somehow that line matters. It would have been ridiculous to go back 500 years and do that. There are things that, that make this worse. There are historical aspects that make this worse. So this is a Yazukuni shrine, right? We all have historical memories about who did who, what to whom. That's me, by the way. <laughs> we all have memories about this. Chinese have memories, Koreans have memories, Japanese have memories, Taiwanese have memories, and it's important to point out that Taiwan makes identical maritime claims that China does over these, over Senkakus over the Spratleys. It's identical claims. And if you actually Google Taiwan fishing fleets uh, Senkaku, you'll see that Taiwan, last December, sent 50 fishing boats to try and claim the islands, etc. Right? Everybody has these historical memories, but the problem is it's not about the past, although they get wound up in each other. It's really about how modern countries do this. And this is one of the interesting things, because when we talk about what it means to be a modern nation state. This is actually a very recent concept. There were some borders because people had to define borders. As I said, a thousand years of marking out some borders. But the idea of a nation state is really modern. Something that is fully implemented over some kind of territory. We've got political control. So everybody, and actually, and here's the interesting thing. So uh, is anybody here from PRC? Anybody? None. Okay. Yeah, right. Usually there's somebody from China who say, do you have a passport? And they say, yes, I do. Of course you do. You have to have a passport. Right? The United States only implemented, the State Department only passed a law saying that they, you could actually give proof of American citizenship in 1856. And people didn't really use them until after World War I. Because it was been obvious who you were back then. So it's about 100 years. Every country around the world, no matter what, you know, whether it's China or Bolivia or whatever else, we all have a flag. We all have a national anthem that sounds like it was written in 1856, uh, Vienna. Oompa, oompa, right? These are 19th century ideas about what it means to be a country. 
They're incredibly recent ideas. That we are a country, we've got a flag, we've got a passport, it really, really matters whether my passport is, says this or that. And along with all that other stuff came the idea that we were going to turn all the frontiers into borders and we were going to make things called treaties in a very modern Western legal sense and write everything down. So they only became a problem when you had to demarcate everything on the globe. Now, this idea of national sovereignty and turning frontiers into borders, even on maritime where nobody lives, is actually in some ways very stabilizing because if you can do it, then the countries have said, I will live with you, you will live with me. And one of the reasons these continue to exist is because of these borders, it makes a, uh, because of the disputes over these territories, they're very cheap domestic political wins for various uh, candidates or leaders to pretend that they're standing tough to each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's an incredibly cheap way to do things. So, what is the relationship between these two? How does business affect politics and politics affect business? I was telling Professor Peck earlier, like I teach, a, uh, every now and then I'll teach an MBA course on doing business in Asia. I did it for about 10 years while I was at Tuck. Uh, and what I would always say is, you go to Asia, business is politics and politics is business. The line between the two is not nearly as, as clear as it is here in the US. And even here in the US, a lot of business is politics, a lot of politics is business. So what's the way in which politics might affect business or business might affect politics? The first way, and the way I actually think is not accurate, is what most people say is they care about these because there's a lot of oil under them. Countries claim the Sprantley Islands and they make these types of claims and they have a fig leaf that says, oh, it's about historical memory and stuff like that. But all they really care about is money. And I'll tell you, number one, there's not that much compared even to say, you know, it's sort of the same as uh, evidently European reserves, right? It's actually not that much. Most of them are unproven. It'll be incredibly costly to get them out of the middle of the ocean. At some point, probably, we'll need oil enough that the price will rise high enough that it'll be economically feasible. But I wish that these disputes were about money. Since all of you are hard-charging MBAs, you know that if it's about money, you can find a solution. One thing about money, you can divide it up. I'll give you $54.32. I want 33 cents, right? There's ways in which you can divide it up. If it's just about oil or fishing or stuff like that, and it's a rational thing that countries are worried about because they're worried about wealth, there's a way that they can solve this fairly easily, especially if it's about oil exploration of unproven reserves. You do a joint exploration. You divide it up 30, 30, 30, or 50, or you invest 50%, you invest 30%, right? There's a bunch of ways in which countries can cooperate and companies can cooperate about this. It doesn't have to be zero sum. And in fact, if it's only about oil, what I would do is I would say, China, it's all yours. You waste all the money trying to figure out whether there's oil there or not. You can waste all the time and energy and resources and money. And then once you pump it out of the ground, I will buy it on the spot market. It makes no sense to try and control oil reserves because it's a global market. It's a spot market. Not a single one of you, I think, knows whether your oil came from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia in your car. I don't, maybe you do, I don't, right? We have no idea, right? It's a global market. Controlling oil doesn't really help you that much. Let somebody else pay for it and get it out of the ground. So in many ways, I think that the business side of it is actually not what's driving these kind of disputes. And certainly, uh, some of the other disputes. The Spratleys, there might be some oil reserves. Nobody thinks the Tokto Takeshima Islands have any uh, uh, economic value. Every now and then a Korean will say, but there's fishing out there. It's like, really? Is that really why you care so much? Right? No, it's not why they care. If it were, it would be great. What do I think it's about? I think it's about nationalism. I think it's about a nation state. And as I said before, it's a very cheap win. So what you get is, you know, respect truth, respect China, 
this is about Tibet, right? But Tibet will always be one, et cetera, et cetera. It's not linked to them. Here are Japanese saying Senkaku Islands belong to Japan, stop the Chinese invasion. These are Koreans saying Tokto Uridang, Tokto is ours, right? And what happens in many ways is, in some ways, because these aren't consequential, because it's not where people live and you have to worry about it, or even where there's really that much economic stuff, it's actually a relatively easy way for you to appear tough, get domestic support at home, and appear like a good nationalist without really having to ramp up and worry about the consequences. Now, I actually may be very cynical about this, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if Abe, the new Japanese prime minister, says to Xi Jinping, and he says, you know, sends someone quietly, says, look, okay, I'm about to make a claim about Senkaku's. You guys get all mad. You yell at me. You'll look good for your guys. I will look good to my guys, okay? Right? Um, I really wouldn't be surprised. Because they're not consequential in the way we think about it. If they actually start to fight over it, I will actually, first of all, I'll come back to you and I'll say, I'm very surprised. I was wrong. I, I find it hard to imagine how war is going to break out over these islands. There is a way. I can tell you a path, but it's a worst case scenario that would go on and on and on and on. The same way I can tell you a path about North and South Korea start a war. This mistake, that mistake, etc., etc. But for 60 years they haven't. We're at the 60th anniversary of the armistice. So yeah, there is a possibility. I just read one of the dumbest articles I've ever read, which was, World War I occurred because of a bunch of mistakes. Now China and Japan are, it's World War I all over again. Head for the hills, women and children first. <laughs> I guarantee you can find it. It's in the last day. I almost try, I almost, you know. Sure, I mean, it's great copy. It makes sense even here. We're reading about it. But as yet, those disputes haven't even become like the South Korea, North Korea dispute, right? But it is harder if it's about this. Why is it harder about this? Because you can paint yourself into a corner. Which is once you've made a claim over these rocks or these islands, they become indivisible now. Now it's very hard for South Korea to say, well, we don't really care. Or Japan to say, we don't really care. In a way, they've become almost sacred spaces. And I've, I've actually thought about this. I may actually start a research project on this, right? Because if you know anything about Korea, the Gunggang Mountains, the Diamond Mountains, have been mentioned in official Korean uh, uh, diplomacy to China as recently, I mean, as, as late as the 11th century, where they say, our kingdom is different than yours because of our beautiful mountains, right? Those mountains in Korea, it's a beautiful, gorgeous mountain range, the, the Diamond Mountains, have been a symbol of what it means to be Korea, again, for a thousand years. They're, it's sort of like, a, what do we have in America? <laughs> I don't know, uh, the Golden Gate or something, right? Some, you know, some physical manifestation of what our country is. The rocks now are becoming a mythical fable thing. In Japan, it was always Mount Fuji as the symbol of Japanese purity. But now these islands are becoming that way. And we may be watching in real time as they create a new myth about what it means to be Japanese or Korean. And as you do that, it's harder to back down from it. So I'm not going to say it's totally inconsequential. Because these countries are painting themselves into a corner with sort of nationalist discourses about who we are, and it mixes in with all the historical stuff I was talking about. Now, what is the economic implications? Can trade or economic relations reduce the squabbling over these islands? Are they really going to challenge this type of trade relation for some islands? It's a very good question. Interestingly enough, China went in about 10 years, went from being a minor trade partner of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to being their number one trading partner. Sort of at the expense of the United States and Japan. Korea is even more dramatic. Korea and China only normalized relations in 1992. The speed with which China became Korea's most important economic partner, and this is the same thing for Japan, I just didn't put these numbers up, is astonishing. Within about a decade, directly at the expense of Japan and the USA. Everybody's economic forces on China. Japan, the United States, excuse me. And so here you do get a question of, are we going to let emotion overcome or pride overcome 
a desire for wealth. And although all of you who take economics courses realize that you know, economists will tell you that yes, you can go, you, know, you can bargain and you should be able to blah, 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 blah. Try insulting somebody by offering them one penny more than what, they, you know, what, that, what they're willing to take and they'll walk away. Most of us will walk away. Pride matters as much. Right? So if somebody offers 50 bucks for something, you offer $50 and one penny, it's rational for you to take it, but someone will say, no way, right? Screw you. And that's the question, right? Is pride going to overcome economic rationality? Or will the economic ties cause them to say, geez, this is dumb, let's tie and tamp it down. It's not clear at this point. Because pride matters to countries in terms of nationalism as much, matter, as, much as it matters to people. And actually we have some interesting, uh, again I use that word, uh, tidbits of that. For the first time in its, in its modern history, the Japanese government sanctioned a private commercial entity when last year they forbade, for about a month, Japanese officials from flying on Korean Air. Because Korean Air uh, flew over Tokyo in a uh, <laughs> kind of show that it's Korean, etc., etc. So the Japanese government now is sanctioning private companies. At the same time, Korea is willing to spend $300 million deterring a rising regional threat. Well, mostly in the United States, when we, t when we worry about the rise of an East Asian power, it's usually China. Korea is spending $300 million to build a naval base to defend those rocks that nobody lives there. That base is not going to help them. They're putting real money, and they're actually going to build an airline, uh, I mean an airline, an airport at Ulung Island, which is the closest place you can sort of land. Again, who knows how many hundred million dollars that'll cost. So the South Korean government is making a claim, this is Korean. So they're locking themselves into, in a number of ways, putting pride over money. And in fact, throwing good money after bad in order to continue these claims, these nationalist claims. So I mean, in many ways, the business implications are probably not, uh, can business help solve these problems? I think in many ways the question is, will business be hurt the more that these go on? We'll see. For the U.S., for the part of the U.S., U.S. official policy has been not to get involved. Nothing to see here, nothing to see here, right? The official U.S. policy is literally, uh, you guys sort it out, just don't fight. Because China, Japan, Korea are three of the seven largest trading partners of the United States. So what, what, what I find in some ways ironic about this is the United States wants to be a leader in East Asia. You may have heard about the Asian pivot, America's return to Asia, yes? No? Clearly it hasn't, <laughs> it's only among policymakers, I guess. Anyway, we're back, we're going back to Asia, we're gonna be the leader, etc., etc. But a leader has to help sort out the most important problems, not the easiest problems, and these are probably the biggest ones, because they are a hindrance, there's no question about it. So I don't have a good answer to whether business is going to solve uh, the conflicts or whether you know, the, the, the conflicts can actually uh, uh, make business worse. But I, I thought I'd conclude, and then we can talk about whatever you want, by talking about history backwards and forwards. Because I think this is an important, an important thing, and then I'll give you my solution to it, actually. Right? History moves both ways. And what I mean by that is, history goes forwards. But we learn about it backwards, by the stories we tell. And much of this is not about history, because it was really a historical claim, and you could pull out some kind of a scroll, uh, f you know, from 500 AD, and some Korean king said, Tokdo is ours, or whatever, the Spratly Islands, they belong to China. If it was really a historical dispute, the solution would be very clear. Get better archaeologists, get better historians then all governments would get together, they'd adjudicate the claims, and then somebody would be right, somebody would be wrong, and they'd say, and then one, let's just say Japan you know, doesn't have a claim, they'd, then the Japanese government would say, oh, okay, you're right, I think they are Korean. Enjoy the islands, <laughs> right? And you can see that's not gonna happen. It is not about history forwards. It's about history backwards and the stories we tell, and in particular, it's about whose side of the story gets told.
That's the history backwards. Everybody's got a story. Everybody who's been in a relationship knows there's two sides to everything that happened, right? And this is about whose side of the story gets told. Does the Korean story of, oh, they're horrible, Japan, blah, 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 or whatever, or does the Japanese story, we were victims, get told? It's about history backward. In other words, it's a contemporary political problem brought on by modernization, by the nation state, and by a bunch of nationalism. And I think this is hilarious. Uh, in 2005, for the first time since the Korean War, North and South Korea uh, connected a phone line between the two sides. It's the first time since the Korean War. And uh, for those of you who can read Korean, what I think is, is hilarious is they connected the phone line from the ancient Korean capital of Kaesong to the island of Dokdo where nobody lives. Because if there's one thing that North and South Korea can agree on, it's that those islands are Korean. Right? We hate the Japanese, blah, 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 right? Um, so here they are, making, making the first phone call. Um, so what do I think, you know, I, I think these are really interesting, and I'd love to talk to you about them uh, however you want. I've, I've been fooling around with this idea, and this will be actually the first public time I've ever said it, um, and I know most Koreans are going to hate the idea. Anybody here from Korea? Couple, okay. Right? Because here's the thing, Koreans want to be a leader. Every Korean president, we're going to be the green leader, we're going to be a leader, we're G20, blah, blah, blah. And my point about leaders is always, as I say about the United States, choose the hard problems, not the easy problems. You want to be a leader, solve these. And here's my solution. I don't see a solution with the modern nation state, 20th century view of what it means to be a country. Because somebody's going to have to win, and somebody's going to have to lose. Because that's what we do with nation states, right? There's a border, and that's where I stop and you start. So somebody's going to have to give up, and somebody else is going to have to win. And I, don't, I cannot imagine South Korea ever saying to Japan, oh, you're right, here you go, we'll pull all our guys out. I certainly can't see the Japanese doing it that way. I don't see that over Senkaku's, I don't see it over, over uh, uh, the Sprantleys. So what's the solution then? I mean, if you want to be a cheap and, and, and keep the domestic politics working, just play it out because I actually think it's far more stable than you will read about. But do you want to be a leader? Do you want to really solve the problem? I think that would be dramatic, I think it'd be awesome. So here's what you do. What I think Pop Kone should do is very quietly, because if you do it publicly, then you're just scoring cheap PR points. What she should do is she'd talk to Abe and she'd say, look, we both know there's no way out of this. What's the solution? We do something that's not nation state sovereignty. And we make it some kind of a joint, beyond the nation state, neutral space. And we jointly administer it. We're not going to solve everything, but we can solve this very easily. And then we show every other country in the region how you do it and how you actually resolve these issues. And if you back away, I'll back away, and we will show everybody how to do it, right? Now, I don't think it'll work. Every time, I, I actually mentioned this informally, when I was in, you know, I go to Korea a lot, right? And all my Korean friends are like, no way, over my dead body, right? I'll cut off my finger. But that would be the solution. That would be dramatic, and that would be leadership, because that's the only way I really see these being solved. One final thing, and then I'll conclude, which is uh, there was a really interesting Weibo uh, internet poll that they did uh, last summer, and they replicated it. Now it's an internet poll, it's not scientific, blah, 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 blah. But they asked Chinese, who are again just as emotional about this as Koreans or Japanese, and they said if your child was born on these uninhabited rocks that are claimed by Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, China, what nationality would they want? Would you want for your kid if you could choose? 40% chose Taiwan. 25% chose Japan, and only 20% chose PRC, which is telling. Framed one way, how dare you insult my country, a billion Chinese are angry. But framed about what they'd like for their children and their own lives, it's a very different view of the world. So there is room for moving if there's actually sort of uh, real leadership among, among uh, the various countries. I'm actually not that hopeful. I think there's too many cheap points to be, to be scored. Uh, but at some point, I mean, if, if I think of a solution, I think it'll end up something like that down the road.